Brent Murray and Rohit Morani, of course, a little bit of background, office hours on my end. One of the co-founders here, Brent and I used to actually work together during our time at Battery a few years ago out in the Bay Area. Then he's went on to do cooler things. We would love to be able to help out individuals, typically analysts and associates, of course, get prepared for roles on the consumer investing side of things. That is really what a lot of office hours does as a whole, whether it be private equity, growth equity, corp dev, hedge funds, venture investing, even some corporate roles as a whole, which I think will be interesting, of course, as we start with Brent around his time in corp dev. But yeah, so aside from uh, the boring side here, Brent, we'd love to learn a little bit more background on your end and then feel free to go into an introduction. Yeah, yeah, of course. So... Uh, like Rohit said, I'm at M13 right now. It's a consumer-focused early stage fund based in Los Angeles, although now we're, we're pretty bi-coastal at this stage. So we have offices in LA and New York, full-time member in, in San Francisco as well. And so you know, we're much everywhere or we're covering everywhere in, in the country right now. Um, my background and get into kind of how I got into venture. I did undergrad at BYU. In my undergrad, I was actually part of a run venture capital firm called University Venture Fund. That's where I really cut my teeth on venture and, and got exposed to what venture capital was. I was a sophomore in college. Uh, so that time, I didn't know at all what I wanted to do after I graduated. But by spending time at this venture firm, we were making investments. And I thought this would be a really cool, interesting job to have eventually. But as part of that program, kind of let everybody know it's really hard to break into venture coming out of undergrad. So a lot of people get in it through different ways, right? Banking, consulting, startups, then going on to found their own companies and then selling them and joining a venture fund later. And so I knew it was going to be a long, windy road to get into venture, but I, I decided, hey, this is eventually where I want to end up. So out of school, I did investment banking. Like you had said, I, I started at City. After a year, I lateraled over to Lazard in the Bay Area. And from there, it was, was much easier to get into other opportunity, a better group. I was getting much more live transaction experience. And so use that to, to start interviewing. And at the time, I thought I wanted to do private equity. I think that's what a lot of my peers were doing. A lot of my colleagues were doing. Undergrad at BYU, a lot of the folks know, that I looked up to were doing private equity. And so I that I would slot um, me pretty naturally. I interviewed it everywhere in the Bay Area, right? All of the Vistas and Tomavos and Enders. And eventually, I yeah, was really, really fortunate to interview with Battery Ventures at their private equity group. Job there, I actually did a stint at Samsung too, but that was a contract job. I had a job at Battery that started a year ahead. I'd already done two years of banking. So I went to the folks at Battery and said, hey, you have kind of maxed out what I'm going to learn in banking. Do you mind if I join a startup or, or do something? Of course, you know, as they're getting good experience for your time here. To the, the guys at Samsung, I said, you know, hey, I have a year of work with you. Joined a strategy team where we did M&A, Corp Dev, business, biz ops, partnerships, basically everything to innovate from within. Then I started at Battery Ventures. And for me, it was a dream job. Right? It was, it was a, a brand name, felt very, very similar when you first joined. A brand name, a great firm. One of one of the older firms on Sand Hill Road, uh, really bright, sharp people. It was the best training ground I could ever hope for. You know, I, I hit this point where I'd been doing private equity at this venture fund for about six months. I just realized it was not a fit for me. I, I didn't like the work that I was doing. I realized, you know, I didn't know why I wanted to do private equity so badly prior to to joining Battery, but for some reason that's what I wanted to do, and and it took me actually doing the job to realize that that's not what I wanted to do long-term. So I ended up being there about a year and a half. I was just really fortunate enough to be introduced to uh, the two founders of M13. It was at a time when they had they had run a, a liquor business for about 10 years. They ended up selling that in 2016. They had Angel invested along the way and built up a pretty good track record of Angel investing in, in D2C brands as well as companies. Uh, so invested early on in Class, in Lyft, in Pinterest. The DSC brand side, you know, a lot of household names, Daily Harvest, these FabFitFun, Ring Doorbell. You know, I met them, was was pretty amazed with their track record of angel investing. More importantly, amazed with what they wanted to build. And they wanted to build a venture firm called M13 that focused on consumer investments that also helped founders after we invested by, you know, giving operating expertise and operating support. Decided, you know, here's here I'm coming from Silicon Valley a great firm and making a jump to a brand new venture fund, right? It's like joining a startup. So a little bit of time to think about it and, and decided, you know, I was willing to take that risk at this point in my career. 
2017, we raised the first fund together and we're kind of on our third fund. Uh, built a team. We have about 35 people, like I said, offices in LA and New York, and it's a different organization when I first joined. So that's my long history and, and, and the venture, but happy to dig in anywhere you want to. Love it. I think it's definitely pretty darn interesting, especially as we'll connect with quite a few analysts. We do is connecting with analysts, right? Figuring out kind of like career plans as a whole. And some will think, okay, here today, maybe I'm looking into like Megafon, like an Apollo, Blackstone, Carlisle, you don't necessarily know why you're trying to go down that route, one angle to it. You necessarily know what you're trying to do. It's like, why exactly are you trying to do it? Kind of similar to what you mentioned, where it's just like, okay, like banking to private equity, especially from like a Lazard or a city, many individuals will go down to very well-known, renowned shops. It's like, okay, you can do it. But the question is like, what exactly am I trying to do? And the other side of it is, is that you technically ended up in like a little bit, buy out for a little bit, but then have been quit at a venture fund for like six years now, right? I think it was on LinkedIn where it was like five years, seven months. So LinkedIn's being like super proactive and they're like, oh, you've been there for six years anyway. But what it's worth, like you can not even like bounce around a little bit, but move around a little bit, really end up where you really, really want to be. And all of a sudden you can see kind of that like real, real acceleration within your career. Become an ass like, hey, listen, like more like buyout investor today or venture consumer, venture consumer, right? It would just be like buyout anymore. And this is like my real, real specialty. This is what I really like. I know it, it's a good point. And the, the point to make is it's different for everybody, right? Where we spent a year and a half in doing private equity in enterprise software. And I disliked it. I have a lot of peers and, and colleagues that did the same thing and they absolutely love it, right? And they couldn't imagine being a consumer investor because it's so different and hard and like, not great businesses, you know, according to them, and, and they want to do enterprise SaaS, right? So it's, yeah. it's all a preference. Okay to jump around and get experience, right? You know, you said, uh, been at, at um, for a little over five years. Before I came here, a single job I had taken was a year to a year and a half. My stint, I, I was at two different investment banks at a corp dev at Samsung. I was at Battery. All of these jobs were a year to a year, year and a half, right? I was bouncing around a lot because I, I didn't really feel like I was a, you know, ADHD, they couldn't sit tight or anything, but each step was very logical in my career development. And then I found something that I truly loved, right? And, and people ask me all the time, you know, how do you like your job? I love my job, right? It's something that I'm passionate about. I have fun doing it. And so it's a very different feel than, you know, any of the other jobs that I had done before, but you're right. It, it took a while to get there and figure out what I wanted to do. It takes time. I think a big, big part of it. I mean, we have a mutual friend, Deepak, who's done really well. Actually, of course, did venture for a little bit, was at Glassdoor a little bit before that. You cut your teeth sometimes at one specific role, one specific job. And then before you know it, you can like really get into a rhythm either there or somewhere else, right? Be open to the fact that like, if you want to try something different, pursue it. From what I have, like what we could tenure shop where like literally at battery, they were like, wrote like, if this is like parachute and HBS GSB. And like, I, excuse my language, like dumbass, like 23 year old self is like Googling into like parachute into HBS. Like Google's not going to give you an answer for that. No chance. No one yeah. will any forum because no one would ever like borderline say that. It's down to it. It's like you're at a 10 year shop. And if you're going to take a risk to go somewhere new, I took a little bit of a risk going with source grub for sure. You took a risk going to an early stage fund where it's like, okay, hopefully this works out. Then I have credentialed experience to fall back on, right? No city. Everyone knows Lazard. Everyone knows BYU. Everyone knows Samsung. Things changed, by the way, over the last, even over the last decade. A decade ago, if you were to leave a Goldman or a Blackstone early to be a founder, it was still kind of seen as, what are you doing, right? Yeah. The, the top, the reason you went to the underground you did, the reason you got your training was to get high profile jobs. Definitely changed. Over the last 10 years today, when you go to an early stage startup or you roll your dice at starting your own thing, those seen as failures at all right? Even if you do fail, right? I mean, that was definitely part of my calculus when I went to M13. And, and I mean, the only reason I did eventually end up going there is, is a belief in the founders, right? And spent time with them and decided it's an early stage risk. Uh, this could not go as planned. But if I'm going to bet on a horse in the race, like I want to bet on them because all of these quality possess. And so for me, risked the proposition, but at the end of the day, you know, I was joining a startup and, and it could have very well failed. And that was part of my calculus said, you know, I've, I've done all these experiences at norms. If I go and I take a risk and a year later, it's not working out. I'm okay. With that, right. I believe in my ability to work hard to get somewhere else, like a specific point in my career where I felt like I need to take this risk, right. Because it's, it's a, 
just something I need in, in my life right now. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I did, but even if it didn't work out, I would have been very glad that I did because of that doing my career. Honestly, uh, and right. If you don't mind me asking, how was the interview process when you were interviewing with them compared to now, like five, five and a half, six years later, compared to kind of what you're looking for in associates in general? Because naturally, of course, I'm sure many of our participants are wondering that, but at the same time, like the team has expanded a lot. I remember really, really really early individuals there. And now like if you go to the team page, you just see like multiple rows being added of like talent development, what have you. Yeah. It was completely different from uh, who founders are for in there, what I'm looking for in adding to my team that already exists now, like very different, right? I think what they were looking for is somebody who's hungry, right? Somebody who wanted to prove themselves, somebody that was curious and wanted to explore different areas, wanted to take a risk, right? Some that had had agreed experience because, you know, we didn't run a venture fund before or built a venture fund. And so you did somebody with that experience that had been at a firm before. You know, look now, everyone always says this, by the way, the bar keeps getting, right? Like if, if a joint venture right now, like, I don't know if I would get a job, right? Because it's so much harder now. It's so much more competitive. Right. There are a lot of people trying to break into this space. And so the question of what I look for in candidates that I, you know, since I've been here and the interviewing manager, if you will, or the, the, the person that is, is making the, the interview decisions and processes for about four people now, and, and then we hired, you know, countless others at the firm, but ones that are running the process. And we have people from all different backgrounds. Really what I'm looking for, all of the resumes and all of the introduction humans that stand out is just being incredibly driven. I always use this term intellectually curious. We're always trying to find that next, right? It's not just the surface level answer. It's, and then why, and then why? And really just under, understanding sectors very, very deeply. And the way that manifests is when I have a conversation with them, asking them about a sector that specifically interests them. It's not just giving me one or two startups that you read from TechCrunch, having a point of view, right? If you have a point of view on digital, for example, we'll, we'll just take one area, digital health, you've been thinking about digital health over of course, several months and specific companies, you've looked at the incumbents, you've read articles, you thought of where's telehealth going in the future? How are brick and mortar providers going to change between now and, and over the next decade? Things like Google was just purchased Amazon yesterday. What, what are the implications of that? It's, it's people that take a deep interest into things that excite and interest them, right? And so that's kind of what I'm looking for, that level deeper of where I can just have a conversation about a sector in technology where I really feel like that person spent to get to know it because they're in it versus giving me the answers that I want to hear is very different. See, um, no, I mean, of course, that makes a lot of sense because I remember even when I was interviewing for growth equity roles back on the associate side, like a spectrum genuinely interests you. I was thinking like, okay, like post-acute care continuum, like workflow automation software, what have we looked at at work? And they're like, no, 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 not like what your general partner tells you, what interests you pursue. I remember thinking about it, I was like, well, like no one's really asked me that. I really think through like what I like and what I'm looking for, because that's effectively a lot of the, from what I found, the associate senior associate VP role will be like, okay might be a little thesis driven, but also at the same time, we have to be a little bit more like market driven, right? What does the market say? Yeah. You have the Apple watch, but the order ring comes up and tomorrow there's something else that comes up. It's like, I'm not going to like necessarily, I'm sure if it's a portfolio company, it's different, but at the end of the day, we have to keep our mind open and understanding of what else is out there because assume that's effectively a lot of kind of like your day to day, just like keeping an ear to the ground. It's new, what's it's coming? What are people liking? What are people thinking about it? And how to overall like develop this like empty thesis. That's absolutely right. Anything interesting you're finding that you can share potentially? What we're looking at right now? General. I mean, so the, the areas that I cover, um, I do mostly commerce, mm -hmm. commerce from B2B SaaS tools that support e-commerce brands, marketplace models in commerce, like shopping, things like that. And then on, on the other side, I do a little bit of fintech, a lot of in prop tech, you know, an investment in a, a fintech slash prop tech company that helps people buy rental properties. So I think the areas that we're finding interesting are we spend a lot of time thinking about the future of commerce and look historically at the firm kind of 2016, basically 2014, 20 to 2016 or 17, a lot of investing. And in, that was kind of the heyday of D2C. You had 
uh, Worker and Casper and uh, Away and all of these named storied brands that built white spaces completely out of nothing because of you know, the power that Shopify uh, brought to them and all of the tools who were able to sell online. Mm-hmm. And you reached a point in 2018, 2019, where the music kind of stopped on those brands and mm-hmm. div to market on paid channels anymore. You kind of hit a ceiling on CAC where the unit economics flipped. It was more acquire a customer than it was to actually sell the product to them. There was just increased competition where the luggage all of a sudden had 20 competitors of you know, D2C luggage brands that were also selling the same thing that they were. And so it got to this point where it's really hard to continue best in D2C. And the last thing is when you look at consumer companies, specifically in D2C, the biggest outcomes you can think of are like those billion dollar brands, the uh, Harris, the Dollar Shave Club, the Ring Doorbell. But for the most part, a lot of exits that happen in D2C are the 100 to $300 million range. And, that, and that's, that's great for founders. That's even great for angel investors who have a $300, $400 million fund. And yeah. the exits coming in D2C are returning 10, 20, $30 million to your fund. It's just not the, the math and unit econo- or the math and economics don't work out for the fund. And so, you know, kind of came to this point where we thought you know, we love commerce in general as a sector, but investing in the brands is really hard to make returns to your fund. So mm-hmm. why don't we take more of an infrastructure approach, a pick and shovel approach, if you will, and invest in the B2B software that's carrying those brands forward. Because I think the number of brands is going to exponentially increase over the next few years. Like, so what we're doing is, is we're investing a lot in that you know, infrastructure enablement layer. And there's a few areas that are super interesting that we've been diving into a lot is how is TikTok going to affect uh, D2C brands? How can they get involved? We've heard a lot of rumors and, and annual evidence from the, our portfolio that Everybody wants to do more. I'm not really sure the strategy. I came across a pretty serious stat. The rising the dollars that brands are going to spend on TikTok this year. So last year, it was about $4 billion. This is expected to be about $12 billion. So 3 x in year over year. To give you perspective, $12 billion, that's more than Snap and Twitter combined. So TikTok has quickly become like this number three behind Facebook. And it's, yeah. it's quickly going to overcome Facebook. It's got a, a long ways to go to overcome it being the number two or number three player. It's pretty exciting. Wide open space right now because there's not a lot of tools that are helping brands advantage of TikTok. Did in a tool or a Shopify platform called Bounty, which helps brand leverage TikTok for UGC marketing, you know, user generated content. It allows you to buy a brand, just about it on TikTok, and you get paid as a customer for video views. You don't need to be a creator or an influencer to strike a deal with a brand. Anybody to buy real video about the brand that they just bought and you get paid based on the video views. Now, of course, creator influencers also flock to that platform because it's a hiring for them on the payment, right? If they really create a good viral video, they get paid based on the video views they have. So it's a new platform that's uh, coming out, but that's what I'm, I'm really excited about right now. How helping brands still go through undiscovered marketing channels, one which is TikTok. Man, like everything comes together in the capacity of like have uh, Ian, uh, a buddy that I'll definitely connect you with if you haven't connected with in Corp Dev and Pixar, all UGC. I'll get friends at Zebic on the crypto side, get paid by the second payrolls because effectively of a lot of user-generated content and influence being like, why should I wait for X dollars? Whereas the thing I do is buy a second by the minute anyway. Yeah, uh, Brent, you bring up like a really good point, of course, as mentors ask us, like, how do you develop some of these theses? How do you think about like, because if I'm thinking about going to TechCrunch, reading about stuff, coming back and not necessarily regurgitating it, but learning about a space and being able to speak about it, naturally banking analysts aren't connecting with CEOs all day, right? Yeah. So I'm people to read about it, but like, how do you think about, okay, so business raised, like, I guess the question we get quite a bit is how do I pitch a series B, series C for a company without having much information that isn't already online? So it, it's hard, right? That's the, the answer hard. And this is what separates those people that are you know willing to dive a couple layers deeper than those that aren't. Some interesting tactics that I've seen from candidates that I've interviewed or my firm has interviewed, if they are in an investment banking role and they don't necessarily rub elbows with entrepreneurs all the time, you hit the first one on the head, which is reading. Like have an appetite for reading information in the market, newsletters, read it to read it, but 
actually consuming that information, thinking about it critically, then going other you know areas inside of that sector that you think are, are fascinating and, and connecting the dots, right? And developing your own thesis. Um, so news articles and and it's a it's not a timing the market like a Warren Buffett quote, right? Not timing the market, but time in market. It's definitely a time in market for absorbing some of these concepts and having a point of view. So that's is especially now uh, as we ex COVID environment, there's a lot of in person meetups. Uh, organizations, things that are going on where you can go and, and talk to founders, right? You have some time with, with so happy hours and events and on in every city where you can actually get that face time with people and just talk to them about their business, right? That's the way that you learn it the most. And then some interesting things that I've seen candidates do is they put this down on paper and so differentiating when you approach somebody in an interview and before and you send them a five or six page, you know, I probably would limit it to that. Don't go overboard with like a 50 page PDF because no, we, we just don't have time to read that. But if you send them a, a quick primer on, hey, I've been a lot of time in digital health and this is what I'm excited about, right? And here's why. And a very clear, distinct thesis. Be 9% wrong on your thesis, right? That's okay. And your first interview, somebody that's really involved in, might tell you that. They might say, you're way off here. That, and you'll restructure things and you'll tinker and, and you'll refine your strategy. And that's just how it works, right? And so a, a way to differentiate yourself is put it on paper, having a thesis, right? And then having people challenge that thesis. Uh, that's the way that you you differentiate. Curiosity is really what it boils down to, it sounds like. It's it's not taking first answer at face value. It's, it's digging deeper and digging deeper. And, no. and that's right. That's what we do all of the time because you're a little bit slower right now, just given it is, but in times of 10 to 15 new calls with companies, right? Or in-person meetings, Zooms, whatever. The part of, of this job and venture is time management. And the whole week on those 15, not depth, just try to cover breadth and never make a decision because I'm inundated with new company. And then the very next week, I tend to need to have need to be quick to decide. You need to go deep on the companies that you think are inter- you know quickly pass or decide that it's not the right time for you on, on companies that don't fit your thesis, right? And so that it's a skill to develop of this whole concept of otherwise you're just dead in the water in this job. As many lists and correct me if I'm taught to think in there and not really taught to think outside that. It's like oh, I've been taught to effectively only do what I do. Now doing anything outside of that scope, then like, I'm not necessarily thinking outside of that scope where it's okay. You do have to remove yourself from the incessant, like checking email and like really being like, okay, fix this, fix that. Yeah. I think like, okay, respectively, like you're trying to do what's interesting. Would you advise some people even go get some like operating experience? Can you go to like an early stage venture fund? Could you go to like an accelerator to see what that's like? How can someone really, really think about like breaking in? Whereas like, unless you go post up at like the Ganser board next to meatpacking stripes office, Right or at like go to LA right and just wait at the proper hotel and someone for a pet with us to walk in. Eric. Yeah, yeah, no. Question. I think at least what we look for. So every venture fund is different. What for is the, my perfect mold is the call it tours of banking and then two years of operating experience. A very interesting perspective. The only person I look for, right? Uh, if, if we look at our, the last few hires that we've made, we kind of fit that mold banking and operating. Another had just been in banking for a few years, another kind of undergrad, right? So we have done that before. Wow. You know, and us, yeah. It's just kind of undergrad. And so we've hired all sorts of different folks. I think having some operating experience is really beneficial, right? I think it's you a different layer of thinking. <laughs> You know, being on the side, understanding how to operate with different functions. You're not just in a services business. So it is a path, but it's not the only path. There is to break in. So you would give yourself to younger Brent when he's in banking, finance, school, that you might tell yourself being like, okay, this is something that like, I knew. I wish I, because I into venture a little bit later, I guess it was after call it three years, but then you know, that was in at Battery Ventures and I spent another year and a half doing more private equity. So I didn't really get into venture until at least four years after my undergrad, which was a long time for me. I wanted to do it much sooner than that, specific, or especially because I had venture experience prior. But the advice I give myself was I have learned to be more curious about sectors and dive deeper. At banking, that scenario you gave of like just doing what you're told, I probably did that too much. 
I would have spent something to be said about getting trained and, and 21, 22 year old kid going into your first banking job. There's a, you don't know anything, right? Because you've been in undergrad and you've just been in school. And so there is something to be said about the first year, year and a half in banking, just put your head down, learn, soak up, be a sponge, right? But then there comes a point where you've done enough cycles and you can start being like an associate at a bank, you know, on your own. How would you position things uh, to your associate VP, uh, MD, right? I probably didn't do that enough. I've used the, all the two years to just do what you're told, told, and then, you know, pick my head up and start interviewing places. So I wish I would have taken my own advice and be a little bit more intellectually. And eventually, once you got path forward, where do you see the firm as a whole and their team going in the next call, like a few years? Is it going to be consistently? And of course, like speak to what you're allowed to speak to, but like consistent yeah. bigger funds, bigger checks, looking at more companies. Yeah. You know, you get an interesting spot at this age where we're at, where we raise three funds now, we'll go out and raise our fourth fund probably next year, uh, just based on the pace of deployment. Every venture fund reaches this year. The dream and goal is just to increase because the way you increase AUM, that's the way that you are recognized as yeah, a big firm in the industry. But at the same time, as you increase fund size, you then need to think about, well, if last was $400 million and we wanted to have, you know, 24 investments where we have our ownership thresholds and have enough capital in to really move the needle. Well, if we're to a $600 million fund in the next fund, then that increases of those positions by 50%. And mm -hmm. we don't have enough investors to actually do that, then right. we're really putting ourselves in a bad spot because we're not in capital efficiently. And so you have to think about all of this stuff in a very regulated way. Yes, we want to increase our brand. We want to increase funds. We want to be able to write bigger checks in the companies we feel high conviction on. But there comes a point where you actually break it down by number of check, average check size, how many check writers you have at the firm. And do you think mm -hmm. you can keep that pace, right? Because I cannot do 10 cold investments every year. That's about one a month. And that's just not realistic. And no venture fund will do that. You might do a few smaller checks that are early stage seed investments or stuff that we do at the series A, it's just not possible. So long way of answering your question. I see us, so right, we, we might increase our fund size a little bit. We'll probably raise, you know, one of these side vehicles that other venture funds do that are called sometimes opportunity funds to allow you to continue to invest in your winners down the line. But really at the end of the day, like we want to build a venture franchise. We look up to names like Sequoia and Benchmark and Andreessen that have been around for a long time. And we want to consider that in that same caliber in the next few years, which means we have to continue and really, we have to brand ourselves well. We have to execute well as a team. But those are actions, right? We want to be seen as, as one of those store franchises specifically. Or to you as a whole in the team. Yeah. You've got a question here, basically pivoting from a different industry like an industrials into consumer tech as you think about it, because correct me if I'm wrong, you were tech TMT during your time in banking? Yeah. 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 Although no, I, I did do at City, my first year of City, I did industrials. Oh, perfect. Pivoted uh, to TMT at start to doing tech m &A. So that, that itself, right? Getting an understanding of the pivot from an industrials tech m a to eventually going to consumer, because I mean, assume the individuals that are applying are coming from consumer groups. What does that look like? And kind of like, how about that? And also, how do you like industrials right now? But I really want consumer, you know, community, maybe generalist, Evercore, Molis, what have you, because it was really opportune, but this is what I really want. And how do I voice that without like leaving my team and laterally? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question. One answer I can give you my perspective from my experience. I was in industrials group at City and I looked where analysts were going from my group and they were not going to places that I wanted to go. Right? Staying at City long-term, going to industrial companies or lateraling to other banks. No examples that I had of analysts going into venture, private equity, the type of jobs that I wanted. I realized I make a change uh, myself in a position to be able to get in front of those. And that's a lateral and, and joined a m a group, which for me ended up being the best decision possible because I then in front of recruiters that placed into private equity, into venture, I then had opportunities in front of the people I needed. Of course, the transactions that I was working on with, you know, some of our clients were Google and Microsoft, 
they naturally put me in a better position to have conversations with uh, inter- I've interviewed people that are industrials or they did not have a consumer background at their uh, at their bank. Would I look, usually, if I'm looking at a resume and I see industrials, right? I first want to know, like, are you a tier industrials banker, right? Did you take the best of your situation? And were you really good at your job? Can I get a sense of that? Are you a top tier caliber? I think, what else did you do? What did you do in your off time? What are your, in your interests? If you focus on industrials companies for two years, that's great. And you made the most of your time. That's great. But what did you do free time? Did you, you know, do a lot of things focused on technology? Did you join groups? Did you, do you have an interest? In, can I get a sense from you uh, in our conversation? You have deep thoughts about that we focus on as a fund because you're, you're trying to sell yourself as the best fit for M13. And what is M13? Focus? We focus on consumer technology. So you convey that is where you like to spend your time, that that's where your interests lie. And it doesn't need to be in a consumer group at a bank. If you want to get more experience in those types of transactions, then yeah, a, a lateral or a group move might make sense. It's not the only option that you have. Definitely in my mind pertains or kind of like around you doing in your time, right? Like really what sort of thing. And then of course, being able to, I think that's a really interesting way to find an investment shop that you want to work at. What are you reading about in your free time and then work that in backwards, right? If you wanted to look yeah. up Warby Parker, like invest into Warby Parker before to figure yeah. out what the answer And you realize then it's a long game, right? You should pressure that, you need to join your fund after two years of banking. There are some people that do, and it's fantastic. And you break in early and that's great. But if you need four years before you join, like, like I did, that is completely fine. And go industrials, bank for years, go to a, I join a startup or a lateral to a different group, or, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can get experience, but from a long-term game, and mm-hmm. try not to, you know, where you, we get stuck so early in our careers is comparing oh, those to peers. Yeah. yeah. And you look at the, you know, who are the top one or two analysts in your class and they got placed at some crazy opportunity. And you're like, I need to do that. 95% of people take a longer road and that's okay. Right. Mm-hmm. So term game. And if you get into venture at 20 or 24, fantastic. If you get into venture at 28, that's Great to have a very long career. Just think about it in long-term perspective and try to get so obsessed with comping yourself with, you know, the top people in your field. Sure. After LinkedIn, uh, yeah. great law. Well, yeah, to be yeah. fair, multiple yeah. ways, in, right? The question actually, because I think this might take a little bit of time, but basically like when pitching a candidate from a company perspective, and of course, like the metrics for valuing startups, whether it be unit economics, LTV to CAC ratios, engagement, rate. question, how does one go about assessing those? How does one go about effectively more about them when they don't have access to like any, a source scrub, some sort of like backend, like tool or database that gives some of this information, right? That like traditional venture investors might have access to. Yeah. Listen, to break it open and tell the secret. We don't have access to a lot of that stuff either. Uh, there's some things that can't get, especially if you're a seed or series A company, until you get the company's deck or materials. So we are often in from behind as well. I think you you can some information from, you know, spend some money on paid prescriptions or paid subscriptions, That's just, I should say. It's like you probably don't pay access to that. You're at a bank or, or an MBA program and you get free access. Things like mm-hmm. the information are paywalled, but they have really in-depth analysis that you actually get some of the metrics. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't think some, when, when somebody, I don't care if TV to cap that, you know, information. What I care about is, do these people and the market that this company is playing in, do they have a perspective on differentiate or long differentiation company? Is there any sort of, they have a perspective on the founding team? Have they about past experience of the founder, the exits of the founders, uh, why that they uniquely situated to build a multi-billion outcome in this space? Ask them about what the market looks like now and over time. Uh, is this that has tailwinds? Is this a market that ex- is expanding? Is it going to be double the size of what it is 10 years from now, right? Are there some thesis you have around that? I don't ask high level business model questions, how much is company selling their product for? And do you think that at a loss right now? Like you could ask that question. A lot of the quick commerce companies out there, the GoPuffs or Gorillas, you know, that is a, a fair question. Will they ever be profitable? 
but I'm not asking you what is GoPuff's exact unit. I can not expect you to know that. So I wouldn't worry so much about that unless you can dig deep in the media or publications and find if anybody's really published anything about it. What comes to your mind, excuse me, when it comes to media publication, follow any podcasts, any, of course, blogs, articles, email, newsletters, other than the office hours yeah. one, of course. Yes, it's probably the best. And that's your, you know, your best source of information. I'll just, uh, I'll open my Spotify, right? And look at the podcasts. I'm a fan of all the podcasts. That's probably my favorite. Talk about, yeah, market trends. 20 Minute VC is good. Uh, the Humor VC is good. Freakonomics Radio. That's cool. Cool. You know, very, very high. I also subscribe to uh, Stratechery. And he, you get that newsletter but you can also subscribe to listen to it in a podcast. So I listen to those as well. Those are main podcasts that I do on walks or, or on the weekends. I think my daily intake of newsletters, Axia is one. I or I get one from, I think it's called Sorcery. Called Sorcery, one for latest news. I get the, so I subscribe to the information and they have a, a few different news. They have a creator economy focused one. They have like a bi-weekly or a semi-weekly one rather that just talks about the main topics. They have a daily one. So that's, mm-hmm. that's a good one. Day. When I subscribe to Not Boring, which is a good newsletter versus good topic. Education side, you know, I usually have Wall Street Journal open, tech open. Actually, where I get most is Twitter. So no. I Twitter a few times, scroll through. If I see interesting posts by people, I click on that. And then I would say the other I suggest, uh, and this is I firm where we're all focused on the same things. A lot right. of the articles or a lot of the interesting things that I see heard from them. And so mm-hmm. if you're going to break into venture, have a Follow group. Bring, yeah. Form a WhatsApp group, form a, an iMessage group, hear interesting things you guys are seeing. Uh, I think that is in a way too, because I can't call sources of information on the internet, but I'm pretty sure my five friends that are focused on the, on the same topics we can get a, a majority of them, right? If we're all kind of sharing with each other. So form and share. Now, like inhale the website, inhale the web presence as a whole uh, of this firm that you can add and not to mention, of course, other firms, right? Anything specifically a consumer VC. You can literally run a consumer VC. It's not looking like a portfolio company that has multiple people involved and follow all of them. Yeah. But, and the last thing on that is you'll venture, you, you're probably already seeing at your jobs currently. Time management is one of the hard skills to master. You can inundate yourself with, non-priorities and you will never be great at your job, right? Part of, I think one of the secrets to venture is that 80-20 rule of being able to use the time focused on high priority, best things to spend your time on, right? The ones that are going to do investments, ones that are going to increase your knowledge space. And so it's my long way of saying during the week, I don't have time to read hours of articles. Sometimes I, I read in the morning and that's kind of my time. I also open all tabs and I save them for the weekend. And I, I might do two hours of reading on Sunday of really interesting topic. I just did not have time to cover during the week. So my suggestion that I have found personally is carving out time to maximize, to allow me to do week and then save these interesting thought provoking to do on the weekend. Nice. And I guess a last point, because of course, since I'm asking, so is M13 hiring right now, hiring in the future? Yeah. What, what might that look like? hiring good people at all times. I don't want you to get inundated with, uh, please, no one send resumes, right? Like that's just like way too far forward, right? Especially after doing like an hour webinar around like why you should be thoughtful or it's not going to necessarily help. But yeah, I'm mean, curious, right? On your end, like, of course, like hiring right now in the future, what that looks like. Yeah, most venture funds are always hiring oddly for great people. And whether I can hire that person tomorrow versus six months from now. It doesn't matter. I'm always open to meeting talented people and getting to know them over a period of time. So most yeah. venture funds that you run into, they're not going to pass up the perfect if in a hiring call. It. The way that most hiring works in venture capital, it's a little different. They're kind of on these year cycles at the same time for your bank processes start. The way that venture work is they hire based on their fund. Because you, when you're raising and it's a $100 million fund, you know the budget from that fund. You know the management fee. If you end up a million dollar fund, all of a sudden you have twice the budget. You can hire twice the people. You know, it doesn't really work that way, but I'm going through. When we looked at teen, we're usually basing it on when is our next fund going to, and then yeah. with our hiring cycles. And that's most venture funds you're going to come across. So, you know, when you're in conversation with people, 
you know, what does your fund look like? When are you raising your next funds? And then you'll get to know people over time, but people probably aren't going to make decisions until their next fund. Now, just because we're not raising a fund until at some point next year, um, cool. and so we'll, we'll kind of kick off a process that starts. Yeah, right. It's all about the long-term game. So if anything, a relationship kind of like, I remember you told me one time, like doing the job for like six months, eight months, a year beforehand, letting yeah. people know that this is genuinely interested to discuss various trends, various businesses. It's like, oh, you know, discussed this like a couple months ago, all of a sudden we ended up raising. What were your thoughts on that? Right? Kind of like building that relationship. And I guess like really long before, sometimes like I'm sure sometimes more media term hires, but sometimes it's like, oh, we've been talking to these people or I know this person for like the last year longer. Yeah. What hired people that we've got to know over the course of the year? We just meet during the interview process, right? We kick off this, we go through the resume thing and, and we hire somebody after two months. We do a lot of rinse checks and talk with everybody that, you know, they've worked with over their professional career to make sure it's the right person. But yep. yeah, I mean, we, we definitely make hires with, with folks that we've gotten to know over the quarter of months because. If a year from now, I kick off a new process and I have a bunch of resumes come through and I'm reading through them, you got to believe that person that I've been getting to know over the course of a year that has sent me some interesting deals, sent me some interesting thoughts on, on marketing that, I'm going to put that top of the list, right? And I'm going to interview and whether beat out the other you know handful of candidates that we have, like that's up to, to them, but it definitely gives you an opportunity to say, Hey, you know, you know, you know me over the course of this period of time. And, and I've heard my fellow, you know, if, totally. if it's an interest and, and I usually put an interview with those people. That's amazing. It isn't just necessarily like waiting around for this job, right? They're doing something else in the interim, Bu totally. building a stock um, like at a like firm, maybe still in banking, maybe thinking about kind of like next steps, but their mind has already been basically thinking like a consumer investor. So yeah. What, what really during an interview, I'm interviewing somebody and I have one or two or three people reach out to me saying, Hey, I, I heard you're interviewing John or, or Sarah. Uh, here's what I think of that really helpful note. Like that goes a long way. Basically, I'm saying, oh, okay, th this is an easy way to filter. This person is is known and trusted from somebody I know and trust. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's move forward. So I think that's a, a good way to get a little bit more trust as well. Job, and then you have to be really good at the job right after. Yeah. And your job already takes up sometimes like time, time and a half of like a normal capacity. Sure. That's really feel like why we're a business. But yeah. We'll need more uh, folks like office hours to basically help them navigate this crazy world of things that they're supposed to do in their downtime, whereas their downtime is not very much, right? And so maybe in a way, that time amount, right? By helping create shortcuts and guides and things like that. Maybe Venmo right after. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> right. Much, much, much appreciated for coming on. And we really appreciate that as a whole, because I feel like venture is generally this like black box that a lot of people have. And it's like, oh, they have much of an understanding of what it looks like. And you're effectively like a perfect example of it's really like tried and true, right? It's not like a, it's like born and I'm going to phenomenal venture consumer investor, right? Like there's so many multiple steps to get there. Sometimes you pinball around a little bit, figure out like, okay, this worked, this. And at the end of the day, like you end up where you want to be in your twenties and thirties, like you still have like more like years thereafter career to be really, really good at this. And I assume five years is naturally really, really good being employees at this venture fund, which is phenomenal. Well, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. But yeah, man, happy to help out where I can uh, with folks trying to break into venture. It can be a long road and not always the easiest. And so uh, a company like this helps people. We definitely pride ourselves on the people. Yeah, I definitely admire uh, Brent and everything that he's done and look up to him as one of our mentors from Battery and Duncan and everyone else included. We'll have to loop him in and do an event sometime. But thanks again, man. Thank you for having him on. Uh, Rohit and I were side by side in, in these little tiny cubicles for, for about a year. And that was fun times. Good the office. Good, uh, good chats. You learn quite a bit someone, especially when like, it's not even like a normal cube, but you can hear their voice. This is like reverberating off of the glass. So you hear yeah. it. It's a whole level of connection. That's right. Yeah, that, that was pretty fun. I love it. Thank you. Anything else comes up, of course, as we come across interesting individuals. This has been amazing. The insight when I'm out in the LA area. Perfect. All right. See you guys. Thanks, Thanks all.